A quick housekeeping item before we start the show today, folks. We're focusing on supporting the show primarily through listener support this year. It's my view that listener-supported programming is critical to the overall media landscape. It keeps content independence intact, and it creates a richer and more vibrant cultural ecosystem. So if you get any value at all from what we're creating here at The Together Show, please subscribe on our website, together.show. Subscribers at any level get bonus clips, many unedited interviews, early access to certain of our episodes, and a community of other listeners. So thank you. Now, on to the show. I agree with the position that two people never agree on anything. That if the two of you are going to town together, you have different reasons. And it is the different reasons and the different motives that make all for the excitement. I'm Eric Newton, and this is Together, the podcast where we explore the truth about human relationships. As a divorce lawyer, I saw thousands of couples break up firsthand. These days, I'm not so interested in breaking couples up, nor in keeping them together. I'm interested in what our relationships can teach us about ourselves and the world that we live in. So on this show, we have honest conversations with real people about real relationships. Last week, during our interview with Michael and Sarah, you may remember that they told us about a therapist that they had worked with over Skype named Al Turtle. And Michael had said that Al had had a huge impact on them, and that Al's style was very much one of direct talk. Well, I got Al's information, and I called him up, and we had a really nice conversation. My intention was just to get to know him a little and maybe do a mic check, but it turned into a full-blown interview. I recorded it, we talked for an hour and a half, And today's episode is one portion of that talk. Now, Al is a very insightful guy, and he had an extremely long career. So to a great extent, I started off thinking of myself as a counselor and a therapist. And then bit by bit, I began to realize what I was doing was teaching. Uh, So now somebody comes to me and says, how do you do that? And I just immediately go to the place of where the answer to that question is. And I can teach them the theory, but they're going to have to learn the skill and practice it. That's Al. These days, Al's retired, he's living in the mountains, and he just takes a few clients over Skype, which makes him very happy. And I have to say that's lucky for the rest of us because it provides a lot of value for all the couples out there. Now, the portion of the conversation that I'm playing today focuses mostly on a specific debate in the therapeutic community and one that really matters to normal people. Namely, is all this inquiry into childhood trauma really necessary or should we be focusing instead on behavior? And either way, what's the point of all of that? Now, Al's answers to the trauma question surprised and frankly inspired me, but rather than spoiling it here, I'll let Al make his own points. Now, as an aside, if you'd like to hear the entire conversation that I had with Al, that whole thing will be available for subscribers on our Patreon page. And you can find links to our Patreon page on our website, which is together.show. So with that, let's go to our interview with Al Turtle. Do you think conflict can be resolved? Oh, yeah. Oh, heavens, yes. And and um, uh, and and what what do you mean by that when you think? Of, when you think of... <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> Are you having fun? I just love this stuff. And you, as you can imagine, I've done however many. Well, you're things. curious. You want to know how to solve it? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me out myself on a certain issue. Okay. Um, I just finished a manuscript for a book. And Good. The thesis of the book, or the sort of the, I think the core argument of the book, and there's a lot to it, of course, as with any book, but the, the core point is conflict isn't something that can ever be done away with. Mm. Um, uh, I, I say it, I say it in a more, I think, inflammatory or kind of eye-catching way, which is conflict can never be resolved. That trait of saying it bluntly and, yeah. and dramatically, that's a teaching yeah. skill. 
Yeah, and, and I do think individual conflicts come and go, of course, and I and I usually think they're not as important as we think they are in the moment. But what I'm saying is, overall, the the experience of conflict is a thing that's never going away, and in some sense, it's how we know. In some sense, it's how we know who we are. And uh, okay, okay, I'll buy that. And the, it's I, the, I won't buy your first thesis. Your second okay. one, it's how we know who we are. Yes. That makes more sense to you. I'll buy yeah. that. That's, so, that's real solid. For me, it's about um, understanding where the conflict is sourced and why it's feeling the way that it is in this particular moment that is access to the peace and the intimacy and that connectedness and the passion that we want in our relationships, not mm. pretending away conflict. Okay. Okay. So you and I, sh I believe you and I should talk because I come at it from about 45 degree different angle. Okay. So yeah, tell me more. That, that is why I was asking the question of, of, do you think conflict can be resolved? And I said, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let, let, let me give you a shocking answer. Okay. Sandra and I, we've been married 30 some years now. Uh, it's my second marriage. My first marriage was 17 years. So I've, I've, I've put some time on this body of marriage and done a hell of a lot of things wrong yeah. and you, you only learn from doing it wrong so I, yeah. I, I have no problem with that sandra and i have not argued since 1995 once nor have we argued with anyone else however in that time we have never agreed on anything. Mm, okay, good, good. I've agreed with the position that two people never agree on anything. Mm. Start at that place. That if the two of you are going to town together, you have different reasons. And it is the different reasons and the different motives that make all for the excitement. And it is also the different reasons that make for the, for as you were saying, that's kind of like sets aside who you are. I'm leaning towards hardware stores. Sandra's leaning towards fabric stores. You know, that, that, that's, that's about who we are. And it's the differences. The attempt to agree is an attempt to hide the differences. there's a layer going on of fear, right? There's this fear that's erupting because yeah. you can have a disagreement. You can have a, eh, you go to McDonald's, I'm going to go to Wendy's. That's just how it is. Or you can say, God damn it. Why can't you just come to Wendy's with me once? <laughs> you know? Right. And the difference between those two is, um, but it's meant notice you're, you're not asking a question. You're not asking a question. You're stating it as a question. Why can't you come to me uh, to Wendy's just once? Remember, uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the fundamental concepts of people is that everybody's doing something that they think is the right thing to do at that time. Right, for sure. So yeah. there, there is an answer to that question. Even if your partner doesn't know the answer, there is an answer. But you're not asking it as though as though you want an answer you're right. asking it as though you're as though the, your partner's not doing what you want them to do which is being a bully and it, of course it doesn't work well right and i'm saying i think that is sourced in fear and the fear is it's an abstraction of i'm not safe here because you don't because I can't trust you or you don't love me enough or we're not going to be okay I'm wasting my whatever. Well, well, yes, but say it differently, you know, because it sounds like power struggle stuff, which is kind of fun stuff. It's where you're using a tool to try to make things better. What you're really doing is saying, I want us both to be loving each other and sharing and being fair with each other and going to Wendy's sometimes and, and McDonald's would seem like pretty fair to me and I'd want to be, make it fair. There's nothing conflictual there. That's what you want. Yeah. And it's amazing that everybody wants that, even though they were raised by parents who didn't do it. But they still want it. 
and they yearn for it and the way they're going about it is to shame their partner which sure as fuck ain't gonna work <laughs> yeah um you know in this conversation you took us back to well but hey use this tool you know here's this tool it's right this tool works yeah. and i'm saying yeah i know the tools work i i try to use them but yeah. remember but but is the, is the doorway to a solution <laughs> Okay, good. So we're getting so because you know the the tool you want to use the tools and yet or but uh, people don't use them even though no they no 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 they do what's automatic no they do what's automatic which just means is what they've been trained to do well, that's that's the whole of it that it's it's just a matter of training it's not uh, uncovering the deep anger fear anxiety stuff that's that's causing people to act so stupidly. Okay, it's so just... let's 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 play that. Let's play that because yeah. you know how this is the usual psychology bullshit. How oh. much do I have to dig into my childhood? How much do we have? The answer is not much. But you do have to dig into your childhood enough to be able to explain to your partner why you just did that stupid bullshit. Anything you do that moves towards increased intimacy will make your relationship stronger. Anything okay. you do that moves away from intimacy, any habit you have that says, don't talk about that, don't look at your past, those are relationship killers. Anything that says, I'd, anytime you can figure out why you do that, I'd like to hear, is a relationship builder. Because you're building deeper and deeper intimacy, which is triggering deeper and deeper senses of safety. I'm safe with this person because, God, I, I know who they are. That, that makes sense. And actually, before I challenge you on the fundamental idea, let me back up and ask you for clarification on one of the tools you're talking about. Sure, go for it. Um, when I was using the analogy of Wendy's versus Burger King or whatever the heck I was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you were saying, ah, wait a minute, you didn't actually, in that scenario of that conflict with your partner, you didn't actually ask the question as a question. Yeah. What Can you uh, spell that out a bit more and, and describe what I did do and what I should be on the lookout, lookout for in those situations? Yeah, you're almost always dealing with the difference between interrogation and interviewing. Sandra and I noticed after we got good at communication that if you watched us from a distance, it looked like we were walking along the road, she's talking and I'm holding a microphone in her mouth like an interviewer and asking her things. And she's going on and talking and talking. And then she'd run to an end and then she'd say, by the way, what about, and we'd reverse direction and we'd reverse where the microphone was. And we'd hand the microphone to the other person, and then we'd interview the other. When you say, let, let, and let's go back to the why, why can't you do that, is not an interviewing technique. It's an attacking technique. If instead you say, I'm really curious why about this whole issue of where we go for dinner, and I, I'd like to know, tell me about what it's like for you to go to this place and that place, and I can share with you what it's like for me. That's an interviewing technique. Showing curiosity, and what I call durable curiosity, uh, is, is the way to go. And asking, why the hell would you do that? That's not curiosity. That's trying to shame somebody. Right, right. Uh, I'm, and, and it's all done in really tone. It's all done in tone. It's all done in tones. So, so a lot of what you have to do is learn how to get to do tones that your partner hears as curious rather than a, hears yeah. as an attack. Which, by the way, let's, uh, there's probably a nuance here as well, which is that it's not an objective thing. The tone that 95% no. of your best buddies might hear exactly. as curious might not be the tone that your wife hears as oh, curious. Okay. Now, you're dealing with, now you're dealing with truth. I mean, around your desert island and you're dealing with some of the rules of truth. Here's one of the rules. What you intend isn't very important. 
how you come across <laughs> is everything. <laughs> and so the funny. only one who knows how you come across is your partner. Yeah. Or and you don't, a, get, you don't and you can't control how you come across, but you can control what you do. You know what you physically do, how you you you, you, know, you can raise your voice. So you're looking for coming across curious. What, what, what do you say to couples when they have that classic moment in in the interaction that you just described, and uh, and and one of them says, "But but but I but I." How can you be angry with me? I was trying to do the right thing. Yes. Of course you were trying to do the right thing. And so am I. And my expression was to get angry. Okay, so let's go for it. Are you ready for high level? Yeah. As, as I was approaching this, I, remember those little shocking phrases that you like to use? I came up with lots of them. Uh -huh. Okay, here's one. Here's the, probably the biggest one. All people make sense all of the time. <laughs> That's so good and so accurate. They make perfect sense to themselves. To themselves, and that's the only place where they do make sense. Right, right. They don't make sense to you. Yeah. They will, you, you can see their sense or be blind to it, but they can't not be making it. So when your wife doesn't want to go to McDonald's and she's doing something that makes sense for her, either yeah. you know about it or you're blind. If you know about it, you've got pretty high levels of intimacy. If you're blind, you ain't got much intimacy yet. So let's go into interviewing and find out why so we can get some more intimacy. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, okay, so... All um, people make sense all of the time. All the All time. The, makes perfect sense that they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful stopper for, you're crazy. You know, Trump is crazy. No, he's not crazy. He makes sense. Yeah. You know, when you say somebody's crazy, what you're doing is turning your back on them. And they may pay attention to you or not. They may say, fuck you, who cares? There's no, there's no objective truth. There's nope, nope. just the, the, the shared experience of it. Yep. And, and that's what's that. I think you did that beautifully. That's phrase, the shared experience of the objective truth. You know, because sometimes I get into the issue of what's truth. And I just say, yeah, I believe in truth. It's there. Everybody experiences and comes away with a different experience. Now, who has the right experience? You, you see people who are in their 70s and 80s who are in love with each other, and they don't act like teenagers, even though they're just as happy as teenagers. But their relationship is based on vast amounts of intimacy. They've gone through lots of stuff to get to yeah. that place. And that's where we want to go. And so we think we're going to get it when we fall in love. And of course, what we do is we have on the one hand all the all the dream of this wonderful stuff, safety and all that sort of stuff. And on the other hand, we don't have the skills yet that go with it. And so we do stuff that fucks it up. And then we go, well, and we have to learn. And we have to learn how to, how to learn the skills of safety. I remember the day I said, my goal in life, Sandra, is to become a source of safety to you. So that when you want safety, you come running to me. And she would stand next to me and she'd say, I'm scared. And I'd say, shit, I got some work to do. Because I want to learn how to be a source of safety to you. I, I love this. And I have to say, you've looped me right back around to okay. the original question where I wanted to challenge you. Good for it. Go for it. Which is, um, again, having to do with trauma. Um, it yes. seems to me like the tools are critical. And yes. um, I mean, not only have you distinguished tools in a way that most people haven't, and, and not only do you have experience with them, but, you know, they're fundamental that uh, effectively using tools is what one of the things that makes humans so capable. 
Yes, and, yes, um, yes. Relationship tools are critical. And right, right, it right. seems to me like our ability to pick those tools up is perhaps directly proportional, but at least deeply related to the amount of uh, trauma that we suffered prior to trying to pick them up. Another way of looking at that, but it's the same thing, is the trauma is experience you faced when dealing with things that were not congruent with the biological dream. They were threats. They were all sorts of shit. And you learn to survive, which is only safety. And you learn some habits, skills that kept you surviving. But, and, you st and you still have those skills. Let, let me give you an example. Your partner is talking at you. Your brain goes blank. It, it just shuts down. And what you do as a survival tool, and now, now how long, if you look in your life, when was the first time your brain went blank? It's probably when you were two years old. Yeah, I was two or three, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. And what you learned to do at two or three was to shut down, was to maybe go to another room if you were allowed to go to another room, but maybe you learned to shut down. Yeah, maybe I just went unconscious. Who and knows you went I'm and you went unconscious. Let's take the, the like this, make it a little tougher. And it's a you're a four year old girl and your uncle is raping you. Yeah, you shut down. Too yeah. much input. You're overwhelmed. That's what you learn to do. Forty years later, you're still shutting down. Yeah. Now, what you have to learn as an adult is that you have choices about what to do when you need to shut down, such as, I need a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> or such as, uh, stay out of my house. Or such as, I'm calling the cops. Or so, there are all sorts of boundary tools so that you don't have to just shut down and stand still. How many times have you stood still and, and in the presence of somebody who was doing overwhelming shit when you really should have gotten out of that situation? New skill, new skill, get out of the situation. You take care of yourself so that you don't have to shut down. Now these are, God, these are really good, Al, and I like the paradigm. It's, it's actually very elegant. Yeah, it is that, elegant, yeah. The, what, what the, the responses from the past were tools, too. Yeah, I've never heard it said that way, and it's a lovely way of saying it. Those are survival tools. But, yeah. you know, the question is, does that behavior you did last year, does it still need it today? Now, that, though I think it's elegant and love it, let me continue to challenge it. Okay. What, what about the internal pain that that woman, 40 years later, is suffering? Granted, the tool that she used as a four-year-old was to shut down. And right. Granted, that tool is not serving her anymore. There's another tool that she could use. And that's those, those things, I think, are both absolutely true. And it also seems to me that she's probably experiencing an immense amount of internal psychological pain and that it's triggered by certain things. Right. Oh, yeah. What yeah. about the pain? What about the pain? Okay. So what, what does one do about metabolizing pain from the past? How do you let go of the past? My experience is once you've got the pain in there, it's never gone. The experience, the memory, the history, it's never gone because we are basically right only memories. <laughs> we can't get rid of these things. <laughs> but so, but what, what techniques do you have? to get through that. Well, there, there are a couple of things that are in the way that are skills that are a problem. The first skill is this is an experience that makes sense and the pain makes sense. And the culture often tells the person they're crazy. They should just stop it. And so the person has to fight off the culture. That's why they go to counseling because they go to a counselor who doesn't shame them for their memory. Doesn't shame them for struggling with their memory. 
and leads them. There are two things that lead you away beyond the pain. One is talk about it. Yeah, amen. So Bring now you've got counselors. You've got the whole realm of witch doctors or whatever you want to call counselors, elders, that are trying to get people to talk. And how many people do you know who say, just don't talk about it? Yeah, or, or you know, I'll handle this on my own. Yes, which is just... <laughs> crazy so the yeah. skills the skills of, of of interviewing are part of the you know if you if both couples interview each other the couples learn to interview each other, they do a lot of talking about these things and as they do the the stuff decays the strength of the story gets smaller and smaller every time you tell it a little bit and the third the second thing is because that's it, the same one as is dropping the shame. Talk about it. Drop the shame yeah, is kind of yeah. Like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. dropping the shame partly is talking about it and saying, "God, look at that kid. How did he survive through that? That's amazing." When you start trying to let go of something, the tool is grief expressing grief grief is the tool to metabolize loss that's what I've learned yeah if you've been taught like most of us certainly I was that you're not supposed to ever cry you are severely fucked yeah you, you don't have access to the most important tool for that tool for life. getting rid of the past Somebody taught me a long time ago that the worst loss of all is the loss of childhood. The loss of dr no, thinking that mom and dad were wonderful and God and Santa Claus existed and all that sort of stuff. And, and you have to grieve that that's going away. That you're having to be an adult. Fuck. I don't want to be an adult. <laughs> And so you have to be good at grieving. Oh, well, our culture teaches you not to grieve. So you've got these two tools, one, one of, for getting rid of the past, uh, uh, the past wounding. One is talking the shit out of it. And the third one, the second one is grieving. And the third one, <laughs> oh God, it's all under a paper I got on, called on frustrations. The third one is that every wound carries its own healing in it. Every wound carries inside it the thing that needs to be done so you'll feel better. It's wrapped up in this bloody bandages. It's the, the thing you need. So when your wife does something that triggers your memory of having been abandoned. So you have a memory of being abandoned and there's that abandonment experience. What you probably need at that moment is someone close at you that says, I'm here for you. Remember. Or some phrase or something. And you hear it and your body says, Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for that for about 40 years. <laughs> and it is, is it that, um, I mean, that strikes me as, as uh, beautiful and true and also a kind of art form unearthing what the thing is that needs to be done or said. I agree. I, I, and man, I've written up a whole procedure of how you do it. Sandra and I did it. It's worth it. It's worth its weight in gold. But you're right. It is, it is actually, it looks like an art form until you get very close and then you'll find it's just a series of techniques and they all make sense. Hmm. You, you've made a really important distinction here that the responsibility and, the, and well, responsibility and cause. So there was a degree of responsibility and, and what I want to know is how did you take ownership of that in a way that didn't sacrifice or make it bigger than it was and somehow sacrifice your own 
integrity and boundary in that moment. Okay, okay. So, uh, blunt phrases, blunt phrases. Yeah. Uh, the first thing we put up on the wall to, as we started learning these lessons, I put it up for myself, which, by the way, your wife probably needs to have put up for her, uh, is you'll never get love by chasing a lizard. Uh, the phrase just reminded you that if somebody's pulling away from you, you will never get love by chasing them. Because the tail just pulls off. Well, because they already think you're killing them. And if you start going after them, it just makes it worse. Right. You have to get them to where they don't think you're killing them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the first sign. The second sign we put up in the refrigerator was all people make sense all of the time. And we found out incessantly there were situations, there were constantly there were situations that we would forget that. Yeah. And the third one is no one can make anyone feel anything. Amen. And we put that sign up for a long time. And so what we were doing, distinguish between the trigger, which is the thing I do, I did it. But I didn't trigger her response. I triggered her response, but I'm not responsible for her response. She did that. She brought the, the uh, um, uh, uh, she brought a, uh, in fact, the chart I've got says I contributed about 0.05 calories. It's a little bit like the key that starts the DA Caterpillar tractor. The key doesn't drive the Caterpillar. The key provides a little bit of electricity that goes to a solenoid, that goes to another solenoid, that goes to a, you know, big solenoid <laughs> that lets the tractor, uh, this big cat pillar, caterpillar tractor start up. In other words, in other words, the tangle, the de delusional tangle of blame is a real problem and a couple will get good at that they will eventually get better and better at knowing in fact Sandra and I spent since, since this is the subject of boundaries what's going on on my side what's going on on your side Sandra and I spent endless times we still do uh, checking out and we'd end up agreeing amazingly on this is yours that is mine this is yours that is mine your interpretation is yours. It comes from your background, from your world, from your... And I protect you to have your background and your interpretation. I want you to feel safe to share with me your background. I don't want to be responsible for your background. I got enough trouble with my own. So yeah. no one can make anyone feel anything. This is just an extension of that. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is the advanced version of it and it is a normal thing that part of growing up is giving up childhood and in childhood you get to blame everybody uh, you know because everyone else is responsible uh supposed to be that's the way your body is designed for it but as you get older and older you end up being responsible for yourself and and how do you make that transition and an awful lot of people don't make that transition, and they just love having somebody to blame. And so right. then you get into argument and blame and stuff like that. Blame is a clue that you're in an argument, uh, and uh, uh, you need to get out of that. Yeah, the blame cycle doesn't, doesn't really go anywhere. No, it doesn't. Well, it well, can go I... on forever and ever. <laughs> but you'll get sick and tired of it and divorce them someday. Al, this is so good. This is such a great conversation. I'm mindful of your time. We've done an hour and 15 minutes when we were supposed to just be doing a mic check. Uh, I'm grateful <laughs> I recorded it. So we may never have to have another call, but this <laughs> turned into something more than I planned. Um, there's a lot. Unfortunately, there is a great deal. Here's the good news. No, here's the bad news. There is a great deal we didn't talk about. Okay. 
the good news is it's finite. It isn't go on forever. There gets to be a point when you've learned it all. That's the good news. The bad part, the bad part is it's quite a bit. Al's views that the skills of relationship success are finite may in fact be totally accurate and frankly I hope it is. He's written about nearly all of them on his website, which is an extraordinary resource for people wishing to polish up on their relationship toolbox. And you can find Al and all of these writings at alturtle.com. That's A-L-T-U-R-T-L-E.com, spelled just like it sounds, and I'll have a link for it on our show notes. As I mentioned, if you'd like to hear the entire conversation that I had with Al, there's about another hour of it, and that's available for subscribers on our website at together.show. And if you liked what you heard today, please do subscribe. It's not free to produce this show, and I would very much love your support. If you've got questions or comments or you just want to connect, you can find us on social media. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash together show. Twitter and Instagram are both at together underscore show. And you can always email me at host at together.guide. That's all for today, folks. Talk to you next week. Thank you.